Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome in this cold weather to the Art Institute of Chicago, and specifically to today's lecture by our dear friend and colleague, Bolaji Campbell. Many thanks for being here. My name is Constantin Petridis, or Costa Petridis. I'm the chair and curator of Arts of Africa here at the Art Institute. And so today's lecture is part of a mini series, if you wish, that is organized in conjunction with our exhibition, The Language of Beauty in African Art, which is on view in our Regenstein Hall until February 27th. So if you haven't seen it yet, I hope that you will make the time to go and visit it, and you have time until the 27th of the next month. And I hope that Bolaji's lecture will inspire you to do so. I should also already point out that there is one more lecture following today's on February 11th, another Saturday at two o'clock, about the power of display um, gold in Akan Art and Aesthetics, a lecture that will be given by Nikwar Kopom, Curator of Arts of Africa and much more at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Before starting today's lecture, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, who are supporting this and a number of select other lectures that are offered in this auditorium. I should also point out that today's uh, lecture will be recorded and that there will be room, if I don't talk too much, for Q&A following the lecture. Um, and there will be mics that will be handed out so that you can ask your questions. But let's uh, turn our attention to today's program. And just to make sure that I don't make any mistakes in the citation of accomplishments, titles, and publications of our speaker of today, um, it is my great, great pleasure for a variety of reasons to welcome Balaji Campbell here, in part because I know him not only as an established and um, admired scholar in the field of African art studies and Yoruba studies in particular, but we go way, way back, despite our young age. We met in 1997 when we were both fellows at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, where we shared an office and we had several conversations, and um, it was the very beginning of our respective professional careers here in the United States. Bolaji is today a professor of the arts of Africa and the African diaspora in the Department of Theory and History of Art and Design at the Rhode Island, Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, and he's held that position for a number of years, about 20, if I'm correct. He holds a PhD in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison nearby, so he's very climatized to the cold weather of the Midwest. But at that school, he was also um, privileged to be uh, mentored by Henry John Drewell, another uh, great Yoruba art scholar. And in many ways, Bolaji, like many other uh, colleagues uh, who focus on the arts of the Yoruba, have uh, prolonged, continued the tradition of Yoruba art scholarship to this day. Bolaji was trained before that in his native Nigeria, specifically at the Obafemi Awolowo University, which used to be the University of Ife in Nigeria, where he got both an MFA and a BA in fine arts. He's an accomplished painter himself, and if you look up his name on Instagram, you'll find some of his most recent creations. But today we're here to hear him speak um, about his most recent project, um, which builds on previous scholarship as it was published in a variety of uh, venues. Um, his first book, was based on his dissertation and specifically dealt with art and aesthetics in Yoruba culture as reflected in mural paintings, religious mural paintings um, in Yoruba land. And that book was titled Painting for the Gods. And today's lecture is related to his most recent book, which I have here, I hold it here. It's called Fabric of Immortality, Ancestral Power, Performance and Agency in Egungun Artistry. That book was published in 2020, and I admit that I just received the copy. I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure I will after hearing Bolaji speak to us about it. The book and the subject matter of the talk are related in a variety of ways to the exhibition that you hope hopefully we'll explore later on, but I have to acknowledge that um there are no objects, despite the fact that the, there's a, a, a considerable selection of Yoruba objects dispersed throughout the show. There are no objects titled or related directly with Egungon in the exhibition. So in many ways, this lecture complements the exhibition and demonstrates that there's much more to say and to show than the exhibition does in its 255 selections. What it does also point out, hopefully, is that 
Yoruba masquerades, like so many forms of African arts, are multisensorial, performative, and dynamic in nature, and that you cannot truly evaluate and appreciate the aesthetics of African art without paying attention to this context, specifically the context of movement, dance, and action. And I hope that after today's lecture, you will understand a little bit more about what African art in Africa really means, and then be able to relate it um, in a creative way to the exhibition and the objects on display in our Regenstein Hall. So with that, I thank you all again for being here, and thank you, Balaji. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Costa, for the warm introduction. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure to be here again in the Midwest, in Chicago. I lived not too far away from here in Madison, Wisconsin, way back some 21 years ago uh, when I was a grad student. And I used to come with some of our students uh, to the Art Institute almost on a yearly basis to look at the exhibition and also uh, walk around the city uh, go visit the Field Museum. It was such a highlight of, you know, uh, the intellectual life in Madison then. The title of my lecture is Yoruba Masking Tradition. When the masquerade dances well, the guides become swollen headed. I want to use that as a way to begin to engage with the aesthetics of the performative arts, that is Yoruba masking. But in order for me to do justice to that, I want to begin with a set of anecdotes. And this goes back to my formative years living in northern Nigeria of the 60s. My father was working with the Nigerian railways, and periodically we moved around. Uh, We'll probably spend two years in a location and then move again to another place. Um, but it was during this period that the masquerade tradition began to make an indelible mark on my childhood uh, because if it was an integral part of the Christmas celebration. <laughs> For some of us who were Southerners who were living in the North, uh, we were often confined to the fringes of the old city uh, because much of northern Nigeria was Islamic, you know, and there were a lot of restrictions. Southerners were not allowed to live in the core, the downtown area, right, of those communities. But they allowed us to practice certain aspects of the cultural tradition from the south. And so little kids will come around uh, specifically with children masquerades during, during the Christmas period. But what made this particularly remarkable for me was that it was a period that my immediate junior brother uh, is John the ancestors now, but he will be terrified anytime he heard the drumming of the masqueraders approaching uh, our house and he will immediately either be saying that he had a headache, he needed to go to the bathroom, or, you know, for one reason or the other, he dashes to my father's bedroom. He's not just happy to stay in the bedroom, he goes under the bed. Because he was often terrified because of the sound of the masquerading. It is the evocative power, right, of the sound that triggered that kind of emotional reaction. But when, I, when we moved to the South, I realized that my brother was not alone in that kind of emotional reaction to drumming, to masquerading. And part of what my, my junior brother was terrified of was that the masquerader had this habit of beating people. It was part of the ritual of masquerading. That's the smart people with the whip. The intent was 
not just to make them responsive, but that it was a kind of spiritual intervention that cured them, that removed you know, vestiges of the past and removed all ailments from their bodies. For me, all of those formed you know, a vital part of my, of my uh, development as a child. But I never really began to engage with masquerading until I became a scholar of African art. And I took much more interest in it. And I realized that masquerading is but a little aspect of a complex triad of interrelated systems of knowledge involving religious belief, uh, philosophical ethos, social practices, artistic creativity, musical and theatrical performances. To behold the masquerade is to encounter the mysterious, the wonderful and the fearful. It is the mediating force at that delicate intersection between the real and the imagined the concrete and the imperceptible, the serious and the playful, the whimsical and the terrifying, the living and the dead. A multi-sensorial tradition shaping ways the tangible wall of the living and the invincible realm of the departed is perceived, re-envisioned, and understood. Amongst the Yoruba of southwestern Nigeria, Egungun, or doing Egungun is a complex evocative performance as tradition that engages all of our vital sense organs, sense of sight, sound, and smell, including the well-orchestrated choreographic movements of dance and music, stimulating every fiber of our auditory senses. To engage with the aesthetics of Egungun, we must of necessity be ready to respond to the multi-layer and evocative multi-sensorial dimensions of the art. We are often mesmerized by the color of the desperate fabrics, the staccato drum rhythms of the pulsating music, the overwhelming smell of the complex multi-layer costumes, and the emotionally charged cathartic experience of the arrival of an otherworldly performer from the outer realm, the abode of Yoruba ancestors. And we cannot even ignore the audience, the teeming masses of humanity in the company of the other worldly performer. And here we see, um, I think I have, okay, we can see a crowd, you know, uh, in the company of the masquerader here, a sea of humanity. But, I don't want to take unnecessary liberties about who the Yorubas are. I don't want to believe that everyone here in the audience, you know, are fully well aware of who those Yoruba peoples are. Yorubas are found in southwestern Nigeria uh, with a sizable presence in the Democratic Republic of Benin because Cousins of Yoruba peoples, you know, were more or less divided between the French and the British, right? At the partitioning of Africa in 1884-1885, randomly, you know, dividing, separating cousins into different nation states. Those of us in Nigeria embraced English, and those of our cousins in the Republic of Benin speak French. But that's not just enough. A sizable number of victims of the internecine wars that raged from 1830 all the way to 1886 in Yoruba land produced a sizable number of Yoruba peoples who became enslaved and they were brought to the Western Hemisphere. A lot ended up in Cuba, substantial majority in Brazil. We have quite a sizable presence of them in Trinidad and Tobago, right? A little bit in Jamaica, a lot in Venezuela, even as far southwards as Chile, you have the presence of Yoruba peoples there. 
Not to talk of even the West African sub-region. Those who were captured on the slave ships were returned to Syria alone, right? And you have them even in Gambia. The, uh, the last tale of this lecture, if I'm able, I'll probably show a little bit of, you know, images of the practices of masking tradition in Brazil, in Argentina, as well as in Sheldon, South Carolina, or Yotunji village. But that goes to show us the presence of Yoruba people, a uh, substantial majority of whom are about 25 million in southwestern Nigeria, where they are concentrated. But today we have adherents of Yoruba ways of life, Yoruba cultural tradition, numbering more than 100 million all over the world. I'm excited. Um, I'm happy that there are practitioners of Yoruba Orisha devotion here in Chicago as well as in Milwaukee, right? It's a testament to the kind of influence Yoruba cultural tradition continues to make. Having said that, uh, let's, let's begin by looking at some of these images. And I wanted to go right away to the concept of masquerading about Yoruba people. Legend has it that if you read Ifa literature, this Yoruba sacred, you know, uh, compendium of history, of culture, of philosophy, of religion, part of which states that Egungun was one of the primordial divinities that Olodumare, the supreme being, sent to the world to reorganize the universe. That is one mythical aspect of the beginning of masking tradition. But we know from oral tradition that masquerading actually began in Ife uh, at a period that is not documented because uh, Yoruba's dealt with oral tradition and not written tradition. But we know of the legend of the, f the person who made initial beginning of masquerading. His name is Amayegun, the very first name I have there on the screen, it was the first masker in Ife. And this happened during the reign of a ruler known as Orni Lafogido, the tenth Orni of Ife. Long, long ago, according to the myth, this shows us how Yoruba people were able to attain immortality. Because masquerading, Egungu itself, is about immortality. Immortality in Yoruba is called Aiku. Loosely translates, you live forever, right? Death, Iku, used to visit people at the old Ojaife. And they will come, death will come with its collaborators, beating people, killing them, and taking some into slavery. And this continued for a while until people could no longer take it. And Amayegun then approached or Ni Lafogido, saying that he had come up with an idea of what to do to intervene, right, to stop this malice. And he designed a costume made of cloth, different colored clothing. He stitched them together. And then he put the left leg in the costume and showed his peers, and they said, this is beautiful. He put the right leg in the costume, showed it to them, he succeeded in covering his entire body in the costume, and it looked fascinating to them. So he hid the costume and waited another market day. And as usual, Iku, death, came. But meanwhile, Amayegun had hidden behind a tree, and he had solicited the help of a few of his own accomplices 
And as soon as death and his acolytes came, Abayegu came out of hiding because he was covered from head to toe in clothing, in different colored clothing. And death became frightened and his acolytes ran away and threw all the sticks that they used in hitting people on the head. So he was able to terrify death and death ran away. And that was the way in which Yoruba was, were able to attain the concept of immortality by defeating death. The myth foregrounds the notion that the custom itself was able to create terror in the mind of Iku, right? And so the costume then became an important material, right? That people can use, right, to reinforce that notion of immortality. But let's fast forward to the 18th century. Uh, 18th century in Oyo, Katunga, to the north of Ife, especially during the reign of Alafi Abiodun at the height of Oyo Imperial Kingdom. In its present distinctive form and pageantry, Odun Egungun is the creation of Esa Ogme, the eponymous ancestor of Yoruba who covers and theatrical performers who made the first costume in collaboration with Eruba Mia Bimbowo Abiodun Alafin's mother. According to Yoruba cultural historian Adeboye Babalola, I mean, Esa Ogme, the person who established the Egungun festival, he was the first mask performer. He was the first one who wore the costume. But before then, Shongo was the fourth, uh, who reigned in the 14th century equally reinforced the notion of ancestor veneration. His legendary father was Oromiyo, who established the kingdom of Oyo. And when Oromiyo died at Ileife, Shango insisted that he wanted the remains of his father to come back to Oyo, but this they did not grant him. But he then collaborated with a league of very old women within the palace quarters to create the idea of ancestor worship. And so these two together form the basis of the notion of celebrating the ancestors amongst all your Yoruba people. But today, the tradition uh, is fully integrated into Yoruba life, Yoruba cultural tradition. At the height of Oyo imperial kingdom, uh, Egungun tradition was a vital part of Oyo imperialism. Wherever Oyo conquered, there will always be a Egungun celebration every June, right, for a couple of weeks uh, in Oyo kingdom. So I'm going to go very quickly now uh, to the classification of Egungun amongst the Oyo Yoruba people. There are about six classifications of the type of costumes that we find in major collections all over the world. Uh, we find uh, Egungun costumes with, typical, uh, with heavy superstructures on them. Uh, those will be called Egun Eleru. Ele Eleru. Uh, the second category is Egun uh, Alabala. The third category uh, will be Egun Ogun, the war masquerades. The fourth is Egun Ode, uh, those created specifically in honor of the Guild of Hunters. Uh, the number five is Egun Gun, uh, that are created specifically uh, for communal intervention, uh, who are taught uh, to make uh, sacrifices to ward of evil in the society. And the last is the tombolo, uh, which uh, 
more or less for entertainment. And so this, this first image here will be the quintessential image of you know, the type of masquerade uh, or costume with a wooden superstructure. Uh, and here you have about three or four figures of on the, in the sculpture, right, in the ensemble, it is meant to honor uh, the, uh, the lineage of those who have transitioned to the great beyond, who have been celebrated. Uh, and here you have a typical, you know, Egungun uh, that celebrates the lineage of warriors here. Uh, it has a huge uh, uh, superstructure on top of his head, which is indeed like a shrine on its own. And this is propitiated before, uh, you know, he can, he can even wear the costume. But you'll also notice that he has uh, Yoruba prestige cloth in the ensemble. You know, the orange and the yellow and the, you know, with uh, linear patterns, uh, hand-woven textiles. You also find the red, you know, with the blues. These are highly regarded, you know, a beautiful kind of uh, fabric that can be used in honor of, uh, you know, the arrival of the embodiments of uh, uh, Yoruba ancestors. I don't know if you also notice uh, in the costume the skull of a monkey, right? Together with the dangling, you know, uh, chains of cowrie shells. Uh, these are very important symbolic images, right? Uh, that are so integral to the history of Igungun itself. The skull of the monkey goes back to the legend, right, of, of how uh, the tradition itself actually started. Uh, time will not allow me to go into the details. Um, the cowrie shells used to be uh, part of, you know, medium of exchange, uh, money, in pre-colonial Yoruba society. You, you have bags and bags of calories, you know, as money that was used in exchange. But today it has transitioned right from the time the British introduced coinage and the paper money. Uh, it has now, you know, more or less transitioned to being uh, a votic symbol, right, for the deity of money, the deity of wealth, Ajay, and also the deity of ambiguity issue. Here you also have a kind of costume. You'll see uh, an image of the talking drum there. You'll see a lot of amulets there. Some of those amuletic pouches uh, contain ins Islamic inscriptions. Uh, when uh, Islamic scholars settled in West Africa from about the 10th up to the 14th century or thereabouts, they brought Islam and uh, the clerics began to write verses of the Quran, right, on pieces of paper and they would fold this up. This would be wrapped in leather or sometimes wrapped in fabric and the edges are sewn and people will wear this on their body as a kind of protection, right? They are amolytic. And it also more or less uh, conflicted with an already existing tradition amongst West Africans where people put empowering substances in containers, right? In little gods known as ado, uh, also in uh, horns, uh, they, they load it up, right, with empowering substances made of you know, uh, uh, backs of trees, uh, feathers of uh, birds and the skins of animals, and they chant the necessary, you know, uh, uh, voice or words that empowers them, that gives them, you know, magical potency. And these are supposed, you know, to be used as a kind of protection, right, for people, for hunters, for warriors. And this type of masquerade, for instance, celebrates the, the uh, lineage of warriors who fought in the Yoruba's wars of the 19th century. 
Uh, here is another, you know, a masquerader. Uh, you can see right on top of him, he also, they also wrapped the wooden superstructure on his head. Uh, but you have the crocheted, you know, uh, fabric covering his head, and of course, the beautiful hand-woven uh, uh, etu, uh, the, the black indigo-dyed fabric with uh, a little bit of red and blue uh, design configurations on it. Then I come to the parts that I began to engage with the cloth in the fabric. Several layers of cloth. I, I remember putting this exhibition together for the Rizzo Museum uh, together with uh, Henry Droll. And uh, we visited, you know, the collection of Hafen Rafen Museum. And here is, you know, the masquerade costume, right, in storage space. And you can see the panoply of, you know, different fabrics, right, that have been carefully uh, quilted. Right? And these are fabrics that are sourced from the global world market. You have velvets there. We have Africanized Dutch wax prints, right? We have uh, ha indigo dye fabric. We have hand woven fabric. The very best that money can buy is what you give to the ancestors. And here is the close up of that same fabric. Here, you will notice that on this costume, there are some of the fabrics that are dangling down, right? They actually go back to that tradition as a kind of memorial, as a kind of acknowledgement of the collaboration between Erubami, Abimbowo, uh, the mother of the Alaf in Abiodu, who gave of her head ties to Asa Ogme, to create the first costume of Egungun, the hair ties used by women, hair ties, you know, which uh, women use for beauty, right? Uh, for their own individual agency. It could also be used sometimes when a woman gets angry. She removes the hair tie and straps it around her waist, right? To hold are flowing, are wrapped around, so that in the heat of anger, she will not lose the clothing, right? She uses the head tie to hold that in place. But it's also the same head tie that is used in strapping babies on the back. And the head tie is also ritualized amongst Yoruba people uh, for progeny, right? For long life for the children. And so it is this same head tie that is the most important item in creating a Kung Kung costume. And so this image here celebrates that, honors that. It's a, it's a symbol of collaboration between a woman, right, and the Egungun institution. Also on the waist of the Marx performer, you see, you know, the clothing there. It's also an acknowledgement of the significance of that head tie. A little close-up of the head tie, and also, you know, some of it display as panels in the image on the on your right, right? Um, and we also see it a reference to that on the waist of Shango priests who become feminized within the context of ritual. Whenever they are performing in honor of Shango, a man needs to adopt a female identity because Shango is, is very jealous. Uh, no man who worships Shango will assume a masculine identity within the context of ritual. All are regarded as Iyawo Shango, uh, you are an elegant Shango, somebody, Shango mounts. Uh, it becomes female gendered within the context of ritual. And therefore, they dress as women wearing skirts, they uh, plate their hair, right, in the female hairstyle of Shuku or Oshu, uh, in honor of Shango. We also have uh, a few individuals who also have ritualized apron, Ibante. 
which contains cowrie shells that I previously mentioned, as well as amulitic objects. And uh, I, don't, I don't know whether this guy here has the horn in his hand, but I have an, another image with somebody with horns uh, that contains empowering substances. Oh, skip. Uh, so we have arrival of uh, Egungu, you know, with a huge crowd of people. And here I want to point in particular to the, uh, to the head, uh, the human head or a representation of the head in this photograph. You can see that right on top of the superstructure here. And uh, women also do precisely the same thing. And here you find the, you know, sea of humanities waiting for their masqueraders to, to appear here. Uh, another famous Igbadon masquerade, Alapan Shonpa, who commands a lot of, you know, crowd. And uh, the kind of fabric he has here is exotic fabric, velvet, as well as uh, beaded wears uh, that are insig insignia, if you will, right, of luxury items uh, that is uh, used in celebrating the, the lineage of the warriors here. Uh, let me skip this because of time. Uh, skip, skip. Let me now come to a few videos that I wanted to show you. I have about three of them. Uh, so that uh, you have a feel of, you know, for the performances. Uh, here is a masquerader, for instance, going through fire. It's a recreation of part of, you know, the wars of the 19th century where, you know, some of the warriors went through fire, putting, you know, a, a lot of communities, you know, uh, in states of anxiety and terror during that period. So, and so this recreates that. Uh, I must not, uh, you know, talk about this without making references to a few collection uh, in the Art Institute here. Here is an area, you know, Egungun celebrating the lineage of hunters. Uh, you find right on top of the superstructure, the horns there are a reference, right, to antelopes, and you also have the image of a monkey. Uh, and according to my friend uh, Costa, uh, there are probably two monkeys there, which alludes to the mystery, part of the legend of, you know, uh, that led to masquerading tradition amongst the Oyo Yoruba in particular. And this is another one, uh, like, almost like a portraiture, the portrait head of a hunter with the characteristic, you know, uh, type of hats that they wear. Uh, that they throw on the side, and uh, so this celebrates that. So you host this right on top of the superstructure. It is like a portraiture, right, of the lineage. Uh, it's a generic portraiture, right, of the lineage of hunters. Uh, it might not necessarily be of an individual in particular, but it represents a type of all the diseased elders in the lineage. But it's, they don't it is not only women, I mean men that are celebrated, women are also, uh, and I'm quickly get to that. This is the third piece. Uh, again, uh, this has the image of a human face uh, together with bird imageries right on top. And these allude to spiritual powers of women uh, amongst Yoruba people. But I cannot talk about Egungun without, you know, emphasizing and stressing the significance of the role that women play. I began by telling you a little bit that the, the, the tradition itself started as a kind of collaboration between Eruba Mia Bimbo, the Queen Mother, as well as, you know, uh, the Yoruba uh, theatrical uh, impresario, Esa um, Ogme. But today, it continues with women who function as the guides, and you can see right in this superstructure, for instance, it is a reference to a woman. So women actually can commission a gungun. Women can have a gungun representation, celebrating their own contribution, unique contribution to the family heritage. And those women I interviewed actually were the ones playing prominent role uh, when they were, uh, you know, uh, consecrating a set of uh, masquerade costumes. 
And you can see the close-up here that it's actually a feminine head, right? Uh, it's not just men that are actually celebrated uh, in, in the tradition. You see all the women beautifully dressed, right? And uh, here, the process with the Egungun to go and pay respects to the ruler uh, of uh, Ibadan, uh, the ruler of Ibadan. And here, they are dancing on the streets. Uh, last category that I have is that group of uh, troubadours, you know, <laughs> magicians uh, who entertain. Their own masquerading has nothing to do with rituals, but just to engage the audience member, right, to entertain them. Uh, the somersaults, uh, they do all sorts of uh, magic. Uh, they can change their costume and become snakes. They can change, I mean, uh, a, a python, a boa conscriptor, all the huge snakes. They do that, and uh, it's quite fa fascinating, mesmerizing for audience members. Um, Last but not the least that I should quickly go through before I stop is the diaspora, diasporic transformation of Egungu. I spent two weeks in Oyotunji in South Carolina uh, looking at Egungu tradition, right? Uh, commissioned by Olori, uh, the wife of the present ruler at Oyotunji, who created this image in, in memory of, his, of our Patana uh, great-grandfather, uh, Captain uh, Pierce, uh, who was a returnee enslaved Yoruba person to Yoruba land. And uh, so she continued that tradition here in Oyotunji. Uh, here is another one commissioned by a priestess of Oshun, uh, Mojisola, uh, who co commissioned uh, an Egungun Oloshun. Um, and uh, here is one in honor of Shango, uh, Yoruba god of thunder. And uh, so the tradition continues there. And last but not the least is this fascinating image in the collection of Rizdi Museum, which is the work of Nick Cave, a Shiga Chicago, you know, scholar, artist. And, uh, and I want to believe a lot of you know much more than I do uh, about Nick Cave. Um, Nick Cave creates all these sun suits that are really fascinating, but it looks very much like a Gungun costume. So let me stop there, and if my friends in the back room can show uh, the series of video clips I have, uh, maybe one after the other, uh, we just take one minute of each, and then we can you know, take question and answers in the end. Thank you.
embodiments of Oya, the goddess of the Niger River, uh, the spirit of Tornado, the consort of Shanko. Thank you. We'll stop there. I can take questions now. I really enjoyed everything you talked about today. I really wanted to ask, um, how do kind of like these ideas, especially about Ogogun and Ifa in general, um, affect your personal art practice? How has it affected my personal art practice? Uh, a lot. It's been quite inspirational uh, because I had my initial training as a painter, so I gravitate towards color. And I see a lot of color, you know, in a gungun. -gung, I've actually done a piece, you know. Years ago, I do remember maybe in 1985, I painted one in particular that celebrates, you know, that influence from masking tradition, from a gungun -gung masquerade. It's all about colors on the canvas. And so uh, that was what mesmerized me, and it still does. I'm still fascinated, you know. Uh, by the beauty, by the artistry, you know, in the costuming of Egungun. Uh, next question. Right here. How do they see through the costume? How do they see through the costume? Uh, the woven mesh uh, actually allows, it's, it's like, you know, doing a crochet, right? And uh, making sure that it holds up big. Uh, I don't know if I can very quickly go back to one or two of the images and you'll be able to see, for instance, here, you could almost see the guy's right, physiognomy features. You could see the eyes and the mouth, and so they can see. They can see. Uh, even, uh, even with a few other ones that are maybe closely packed, you can see. Uh, but it, it has... It's mediated in ways in which they cannot apprehend everything before them, which is one of the reasons why I believe they have guides, right? They have the women, you know, urging them on, encouraging them, right? And when they dance well, uh, the guides are excited and they also you know, spontaneously respond by equally dancing because they are pleased. It's part of the aesthetics of Ikungu. Thank you. 
Thank you for, for this very interesting lecture. Just one, one question. In the 19th century or before, so the masks that are called or gung gung look like they have elongated skulls. What, was it a practice of binding the skulls of individuals that, that, that danced in, in the masquerades? Why did they have skulls in them? Uh, I showed if one or two examples, you know, that has skulls. These are monkey skulls. And those monkey skulls allude to the legend, you know, of the, of the mystery of Egungun, um, where uh, the, the corpse of a disease was left on the ground and subsequently, you know, uh, because, because the children never gave that corpse the befitting burial and the, uh, a few of the children could not produce children themselves and through divination the lands that they had neglected the, you know, the remains of the father and so they were encouraged to go and you know, recover that and give a befitting burial and so the skull there alluded to that. No, I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I didn't say it clearly enough. It, it looked like the shape of the skull. Early on, you had a wooden mask. Okay. That, that, that was a black wooden mask, I think, that was in one of the early slides, where the shape of the skull was very elongated. Is it this one? This one, yes. This one. Yeah. So were the skulls bound? No, these are, these are references to human heads, uh, which probably represent diseased ancestors within the lineage. And in this instance, it is image of a woman, possibly a Shango priestess, surrounded by children. Thank you for the talk. <clears throat> um, could you say something about the... Um, the meaning of the masks that do not take on face-like forms. So the idea that the mask not only obliterates a particular, you know, masks a particular face, but masks the idea of the face itself. And what, what meaning does that carry, the lack of face that's presented? Because Egungo itself is the embodiment of the spirits of ancestors not necessarily of a particular diseased parent or grandparent, but the entire lineage. So it becomes depersonalized, right? Uh, it becomes a generic symbol representing maybe the male ancestors in, within the lineage or female ancestors within the lineage. Uh, so there are certain physiognomic features. For instance, we're looking at this image, it has, you know, sequestration marks the lineage marks of identity on them. Maybe every member within the lineage at some point in the past had some of those marks as their own peculiar marks of identity within the lineage. And so they make, they, uh, the sculptors make sure they inscribe those marks there, right? But they are, at best, they are generic representation of lineage ancestors, not of particular individuals. Any more? Yes. Two more in the back. So I, I didn't understand why in that sort of TV of sticks, why they would set that on fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, they had to set it on fire because the costume probably had fire retardants. And these are, this is a testament to one, uh, the kind of powers that they had within the lineage, that's the ancestor that the masquerader, you know, represented, went through a lot of fire during the Yoruba civil wars, right? Uh, because periodically the, the soldiers, the warriors, you know, will set an entire village on fire and they will go through that. Sometimes the victims, you know, of such 
fire become sold into slavery, right? And so for some of those masqueraders, I mean, for some of those warriors, they went through fires. And so that was recreating that, you know, creating the ambience of what, what the warriors went through, you know, at the trying times during Yoruba civil wars. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I have two questions, if I may. The first one is, you have these great images with the igungun in the sea of people. And can you talk a little bit about how he first, how the, the mask first engages with the crowd? Where, where does it start? Where does it start? And uh, then my other question, I'm curious about where is the mask, yes. This image? Yes. Okay. How does the masquerader first engage with the crowd? Where, where does it come from? Uh, each, each of the masqueraders, you know, come out of their lineage compounds, cut out throughout the down, downtown areas of Ibadan, and they come out in procession. And where do they head? They head to the homes of, you know, the chiefs and the, and the ruler of Ibadan. They pay their homage, and this particular uh, masquerader must of necessity visits the paramount ruler in Ibadan. If he does not visit the paramount ruler, the ruler will die before the next Egungu festival. So it was very important. And if he chooses to ignore to visit, it's, it's a very bad omen. Uh, and so he goes around, you know, to the homes of important people in the community, and you have a trunk of, you know, huge masses of people going with them, you know, in paying their respects. There are also another category of masqueraders. We, whenever they come out, they restrict, you know, the people who might be in the audience because those are specifically connected with rituals, collecting certain ritual waters and leaves and sprinkling some of the water to cleanse the society and depositing same, you know, maybe at midnight as a kind of ritual cleansing for the entire community. And that is often restricted, you know. Uh, very few people are allowed to participate in such uh, pageantry. Thank you. And then where, where are the costumes kept during the rest of the year when they're not being performed? Uh, traditionally, they kept the costumes in the rafters. In the rafters, it's like you're keeping them here in the attic, all right? But because of theft, because, you know, some of this costume, you know, command a lot of money on the auction block, right? and a lot of people stole them. I was quite surprised, you know, while carrying out this research, especially, you know, in the summer of 2007, that I visited the home of the head of the masquerade group in Ibadan, and I saw some costumes hung in their living room. And they do that because it is within the public care, right? Anyone who wants to touch the costume uh, you know, there's, there's nothing to hide. You can make away with such a costume display in plain view, <laughs> all right? So that's, that's the way in which, you know, they are now intervening to stem the tide of the thefts, you know, of such important materials that are being sold, you know, all over the world. All right, one last one. What are you? Santa Sana. I have a question about the ancestral veneration that you spoke to in here in terms of Yoruba culture. And also maybe if you could connect that with me to me with that uh, generational uh, lineage, the whole generational thing in Yoruba culture, please. Thank you. Egungu itself, thank you for the wonderful question. Egungu itself is about ancestral veneration, right? And who are ancestors? My favorite grandmother, favorite grandfather, right? You have special bond and relationship with them while they are still living, where they are still with us. You can get away with a lot of things with grandmothers and grandfathers, right? And when they leave, 
they come back sometimes in dreams, right? But Yoruba make believe that they come back physically embodied in this costume to intervene in the living. They come back with prayers. They come back to settle disputes within the family. Egungun itself is an embodiment of those ancestors, right? And the lineage goes back. It's not just the immediate grandmother, great-grandparents, right? Some of the wonderful things those great-grandparents did. They become, you know, an integral part of the history of the family. They are codified in the oral tradition, in Oriki, yeah, right? The lineage citation poetry that are used, you know, to document the history of the activities of these wonderful people in our lives. So Egungun is a celebration of those ancestors to keep their treasure memories alive. Thank you.